Hi, my name is David Siegel. I have a drill press in my living room here. I have a router in the kitchen. I've got dust collection sitting in the hallway. And I thought, what could I do for the office? You know, what can I do so that in between working on the computer when I want to stretch a little bit, I might be able to do a little something, do some project work or do something interesting. Why don't I get a table saw for the office? So I did. I got a Delta 365100 T2 cast iron table saw for my office. It's uh, it's great at making dust, which is always good for the computer and the hard drive. This one hour video will show you the unboxing, assembly, and a review of this Delta 10 inch table saw. It's good for people considering buying a new saw of any kind. It'll be fun for people who already have a saw and are interested in such things. I've done a lot of modification to the saw. I'm not afraid to saw, chop, uh, drill, and hack my saw, and you'll see lots of hacks and changes. Along the way, you'll see why they say this saw is a bit finicky, uh, why I love it so much, um, a lot about accessories and things I think are really important to have. I'm gonna rip out almost all the safety equipment and replace it with something else. These instructions go well beyond the manual, which is not particularly good, and goes into some theory of table saws. And I have some recommendations for all saw manufacturers who want to make the next generation of even better table saws. The saw is beautifully packaged and the directions are very clear and it's just super easy to assemble. I, I'm assuming the, all the hardware comes in little labeled bags that correspond to the instructions. Okay, I have put grease on all the nuts I'm about to use and I have greased these interior tubes. Gonna need a little degreasing, and it's it's just beautiful. It's so solid. These are so precise. Using these guys like this. They give you this setup, but the truth is, there's no way to adjust this if this doesn't come out perfect. There's no up and down here, but this is a countersunk bolt here, and it's it has no way to go up or down, and uh, it's perfect, but I don't know why we have this thing, and I don't know what I would do if it were not perfectly aligned. I'm always looking for ways to make my work easier and less dangerous. So I put a towel here, really doubled up 
four eight times I think here to jam this so that's held pretty well and then I was able to get the two got to do the ends first I was able to get the two bolts in here and I've got two bolts and two nuts to put on this side You know, you don't get really a micro adjustment here. You just have to nail it. I want to show you how I'm putting this in. This is the right wing. And I use the, the cloth method again to get it in and set my screws. I've got two screws here, two, bo two bolts here, two bolts here. These are, uh, these are the countersunk. And then there are three inside that attach here. One, two, three. And there are some set screws, which would be great if you want to widen a gap here, but I don't understand why you would need set screws. What I want is I want these, this joint here to be super flat. So I've rigged up two square dowels where I'm able to now control the height of the table and just start dialing in. That's basically, basically there. Okay, it's too high. Okay, I have it perfect. It's perfect in the middle. Uh, I just need to finish the sides and this wing is done. I decided to cut this by hand because my cutoff blade wasn't really going very quickly and this is a lot quieter. And it's actually working pretty well. That wasn't too bad. Now I can bend this <clears throat> and break it off, but I don't like that. It's very hard to it's very hard to finish that off once you've bent it. <clears throat> when you use a hacksaw, you really want to get the blade tight. This is not just for installing the blade, this is for tightening. And you want quite a bit of tension on the blade so that you sort of fear that it might snap. That's how much tension you want. <laughs> that was... Fifteen minutes of sawing, and uh, here's the first part where I use a cutoff wheel. So I'll have to. This is actually pretty good. For this corner here, I just want this bar with the scale on it to be the corner, the edge and I want to cut this back. It doesn't support the bar. Here is the bolt right here underneath that's supporting. So actually this is just hanging in the air. This, this is doing nothing. And remember, this is the cheap part. This is the expensive part. I'm not going to cut this. So I'm just going to cut this pretty far back, you know, back here uh, and get it out of the way because it won't affect the travel or the operation of the fence as it comes over here. That's, that's the limit right there. And that's what I've designed. Actually, that will get me to 24 inches right there. One thing, I wanted to start going vertical so I have access to this flat face here. And I can cut at a gentle angle. And then once I'm through, I'll be able to cut flat on the bottom, which I couldn't do if I started with that. 
Second thing, there's a difference between the width of the blade and the kerf. The kerf is the width of the cut and the width of the blade is usually less and that's true on a table saw this is true with most saws because the saw usually has a wave or a left right pattern to the teeth to make room for the blade to come through and so the the word kerf is a good term because it's not the same as the width of the blade. Now this part, the bottom, I realized I can just bend and just work it off because no one will ever see it. Uh, I'm just going to try to get it scored here on top so I have a clean, so I have a clean line to break. I don't want to really tear it to too much of an angle. There we go. Okay. So that's off. Clean it up and put it back together. I've made one adjustment to the set screw here. I'll show it to you in a second. And if you look carefully, you can see I have about a thumbnail width all the way along here, which means this is parallel. We can see if we see any daylight here. And we do. We see a little bit of daylight. <laughs> we're gonna try to lower this side. There we go, now we're getting there. Raise this side a little bit. I don't know how much I can get away with here. There. And now we're almost there. There we go. See that? I'm turning. See that? Can you see that? That's open. That's closed. That's really well done. Now let's check over here. And that's perfect. I just got the rib fence on and I want to shoot, show two things. First, in a few places on this saw, there are these little uh, nubs uh, that were not finished properly and they got they got some of them got painted over and they're very sharp and they're they're they'll cut you easily uh, I found a couple more actually on this on the uh, angle iron supporting the square so I'm just taking some of those off I don't know how those got past quality inspection but they did now this came out pretty well uh, I've got I've cut this back about six inches and I've cut the other side about three inches and now it, it's easy to get around as I go into my office. Uh, it looks nice. I haven't really changed the this main bar except I put a few different holes in it. Okay, I, re I relocated the on off switch because it was hanging way over there from the previous mount and I had to drill and tap this square bar to do that. Now stop right there. I'm interrupting your installation of your fantastic new table saw to tell you that you have bought a cast iron product and cast iron requires serious maintenance. So I've had my saw six months now and probably every six weeks I go through this routine. So I'm going to show you the, the cast iron maintenance routine and first if you are just getting it out of the box I highly recommend number one uh, just take the take the cast iron leaves if you have them to a work table and just degrease them paper towel and acetone. Now we go into the normal maintenance routine that you should do immediately before you set up your saw. You can even do it before you put the leaves on so that you get the sides uh, properly cleaned and waxed uh, and then put it together and then don't get any water on it because water is not your friend. Water will stain cast iron. So keep your drinks, your sticky stuff, 
uh, you know, anything that is, even your fingerprints, if you've got wet, wet fingers, or if you come into the shop from outside and put your wet coat down, that's, a, that's gonna make a stain on your cast iron. So um, we're gonna do three steps to a good cast iron finish. The first one is with WD-40, uh, we're gonna work it in and get out any little stains. I actually have some little marks that I wanna get out this time. Uh, then we're gonna take that out with denatured alcohol or naphtha. Those are the only two. Finally, we're going to wax the top with a paste wax or with some kind of a crystalline wax like this. I think it's better if you set it up your table saw properly than to try to get it going and start using it before you protect your cast iron surface. All right, so a reasonable amount of WD-40 and you're gonna use the gray scotch brake pads and straight up and down. If you have any little bits of rust or stains, uh, you don't wanna overwork that area. You wanna have nice long strokes uh, and this will turn into kind of a slurry. This will get dirty because you're picking up uh, bits of cast iron and turning it into a little paste. And uh, I don't know why WD-40 is the only thing to use, but apparently it is. And really this step is the cleaning step. So if it's already pretty clean, you don't need a lot of effort here. A lot of people recommend that you let this dry, let it soak, let it sit overnight. Uh, I don't know how important that is, but you can see that it gets a lot of material. And this is all material you want to take away, so you're going to use a bunch of paper towels. The next thing you're going to do is use naphtha or denatured alcohol to remove the last bits of WD-40. And this stuff is very flammable, so make sure this does not get too hot in summer. And once you've used up half a can, Put it into a smaller container because it's the fumes that are flammable, really. <clears throat> Two to three coats of wax. This Renaissance microcrystalline wax is great. This lasts about six months. <clears throat> you don't really end up using that much. The wax dries hard. So if you leave it like little piles of it, it'll be harder to get up. It really helps to put the wax on in a thin coat straight up and down. And then you just puff it out. Now, assuming the blade is fairly straight, I can dial in the vertical adjustment using you could do it that way, but the right thing to do if you're spending money on this saw is to get an angle finder. This is a Klein angle finder. Anything in the $23, $24 range is great. It is not a leveler. It doesn't know anything about levelers. level, so you're gonna set it to zero when it's on the table here. Just turn it on and set it to zero. And then, oops, and then you just stick it on the blade and 90, exactly. Now, it's easy enough to do it with a, a combination square or some kind of a right angle when you're getting it upright, but when it's at 45 degrees, you want it to be at 45.0 degrees. That way you get your miters right. And if you want it at 30 degrees, you want it at 30. This is not a big investment. You want it to be small like this so that it fits on the blade and or even a smaller blade. You know, don't wait to get it 
Once you verify that this is straight up and down at 90 degrees, then you can go down here and the visual gauge here, you can just align this red mark with the black mark, the zero behind, just by unscrewing here and then moving this plate, this acrylic plate just a bit so you get this all set up properly. And when it's at zero here, you know that it's at 90 degrees on the saw. So this is why, because the blade isn't perfectly flat, we mark the blade and then we use the mark and not just you know, every time we come back to the mark. So let's do that. So I'm setting it up so it's just touching. And now we'll go to the other side. And we can see that it's pretty close but it's a little it's a little pinching if you're going to be running the material on the right and the fence is going to be on the right it's a little bit pinching okay let's have a quick tour here underneath this is the motor here and you can see there's a red reset button uh right here so that if the if the uh, motor gets too hot or if it gets too too much resistance it'll cut off and you have to wait a few minutes and then press the reset button. And then here's the here's the motor mount. It's it's two parts. This is the back part. And to undo it, to be able to move the blade, to be able to turn the blade a little bit, you need to take to back this off, this bolt, and then there's another bolt that's hidden by this fabric that forms the dust collection system dust chute so so it's actually right here the bolt it's right here and uh so it's really really inconvenient to be able to adjust that uh this used to be on previous models was a thumb screw which you had to get out of the way to be able to work here and now now they've replaced the thumb screw with just a normal screw and i'm pretty sure you don't have to touch that to make this adjustment so I haven't and I realize that there's a lot of fabric here to extend when it's at a 45 degree angle so now I've extended it and the bolt I want here's the bottom one the bolt I want is right here I have now removed three screws so this I've got three screws out here and I've got access to the bottom. The bottom bolt is here. And then the top bolt is right here. You can see some Loctite there. These bolts are really stuck in tight. That's why you need, you need the five millimeter Allen key. So by rotating the blade back to vertical, I get more room from the, or toward vertical, I get more room from the material here and I can now see if I can get my hand in here to open this <sighs> they don't make it easy okay the allen key is in there and it's really on with Loctite ah <sighs> That was hard. Just so you can see how difficult this is. It shouldn't be this hard to adjust your blade. Okay, that's essentially just touching. 
I'm gonna come across here and I wanted to touch a little more here on the, on the back than on the front. I'm supposed to be able to pull or push the motor itself to move it. See that? I can move it. See that? So now I'm getting somewhere. Let's go back here. Okay, here we don't touch, but it's close. And here, if it touches, uh, I'm gonna be happy about that. Yeah, it touches now. It touches. Okay, I have a correction to make. This is 4.75 millimeters, and that was the wrong tool for the job, but they give you this, and this is five, cent, five millimeters, and it has the correct size of Phillips head to undo those small screws for the fabric of the dust system. So this is the tool you need. I will just get the tool in there and turn. I don't know how much of this I can do one-handed. And I can get it up and tighten it. The people in Delta have given you all the tools, well, a bunch of the tools you need to install the, the saw, and two of them are these two Allen keys. And you can see this one is the one for most of the wings and the top surfaces and then and it you know gives you a little leverage with this and then this is just for the under parts the carriage mounts and so forth that under and look look this one is four and three quarter millimeter and this one is five millimeter and i can tell you they don't work on the other's bolt it would be a lot better in my view if they just give you a five millimeter bolt pattern for the whole saw so you don't get confused and you don't end up trying to figure out where the right Allen key is for when you get to moving the motor mounts around. And that's just a sort of a simple user interface thing. Just the little things that help, especially when the people putting them together haven't done it before. And a lot of people buying this saw haven't done it before. There's a saying in user interface design that I like because it's wrong. <laughs> People say, you don't design simplicity in, you take complexity out. And believe it or not, you actually design simplicity in. Um, simplicity is a feature and you have to work on it to, and sometimes it's a little harder, take, you maybe takes longer to do what you want, but it's simpler. It's just like driving, if you give someone driving less, driving directions for somewhere that you know very well in your own town and they wanna get from here to there, there is usually the more longer way that is simpler, right? That's easier to describe and it's got fewer mistakes. And then there's the short way that you would take, the shortcut, which is more complicated, right? So you, you design, you build simplicity in by taking the user's point of view and not the engineer's. Now I'm about to install and test out all of the safety features that come with the saw, the riving knife and the blade guard and, and all that. But then I'm gonna take all that stuff completely out. I'm going to completely remove the riving knife assembly entirely and get rid of the little flip down fence and the, the blade guard, the pawl, every, every the kickback uh, pawls, all that stuff is gonna go away. And instead I'm gonna make a zero clearance throat plates with uh, splitters. And that that's my safety system. 
plus the, the grippers and all that. So you, you can now follow along and watch me install the safety and align everything and get it all working, or you can skip it. This is the down position, and you can lock it here. Now it's locked. Now it's locked, and you can also pull it up. It's a little harder to do with one hand there. You see it's rotating until it goes back against that side again, and then you can go down. So it only has two positions where this will go fully down. The rest of the time it won't. So that's actually really well designed, and you can pull it out. And I'm, I'm going to take it out now. Here's a tour of the motor compartment from the top. And this is the dust collection bin here. So this, this black sheet metal is the dust system that goes down to the, to the extraction port. Now here's the riving knife armature. And it has two position screws and two set screws. And I believe I understand what they are for. Now, it's important to see that this, this goes back and forth by maybe a millimeter, okay? And this is for the riving knife. One inch is 25.4 millimeters. 10 inch is 254 millimeters. Okay, and this fits. But when I put the 255 millimeter blade, it's only half a millimeter larger on each side. It actually rubbed up against this piece right here. And uh, so it's important to make sure that this carriage or this armature for the riving knife is this way. And so once I pull it this way, I'm going to see, I'll, I'll show you, it goes this and then this way. So this way, this way, this way, this way. So I'm gonna set it up this way toward me so it has more, more room. And I believe I now, once that is pretty well set, not fully, not super hard, but, but, in, but mostly, then I can change the angle, this is the yaw angle, this way of the riving knife, right? And I can then put, set that down here. And then these two set screws, I believe, will then change the, uh, the roll angle of the riving knife. Okay, I gotta show you this. This is my, I just did my first power on and I didn't kill the lights. I didn't trip the breaker. Uh, it works. <laughs> See how quiet it is? It's awesome. Now I've reset this plate here so that this is up and down. This is right behind the blade. I'm happy with that. And that's both in the high position and in the low position. As long as you can lock it, then it's, then it's uh, sunk into one of the grooves. And you know, it's not perfect. When it's high and low, it gets a little bit out, and that's, I'm sure, my fault not being perfect on this multi-axis alignment. So now the first thing is the is the pawls, and you need it in the highest position that it will lock in to put this all together. And remember, to put these in, you have to push and then seat that so it comes back out. Now the pawls are in place. The blade guard is quite easy. All you have to do is hook this axle, this, this little axle, this little pin right here. <clears throat> Once that's hooked, then it's just gonna fold down. Hmm, I've gotta get my throat plate in. And then this just locks and this is solid and ready to go. Now, now I want to lower the blade 
without jamming the poles. Yeah, that's what this surface is for, so that's pretty smooth. So that works well. And I want this just a bit higher than my piece. You think you know how to take a saw blade off of a table saw, but on this particular table saw, you don't get very many of the indents in the spindle for grabbing by the, uh, the holder. So you rotate first by hand to find that and lock in, and then it's easy. Then it's easy to take off. So then when you put the next one on, it's already there and you can easily just push in the keeper and tighten it up. And so now you don't spend any time trying to find it with the, with the wrench. Now with my guard in place, the height of the blade should go down a bit. go. The height of the blade is right. And now I will make my first cut. Dust collector is pretty quiet. I found an old, well, not too old bed in pretty good shape downstairs. It's, it's better quality than uh, Ikea. And I'm gonna use it to make a table to take off an off feed table to take my uh, wood and whatever else comes off the saw. And, uh, and I also found a nice uh, bookcase downstairs. It's great to live in a building with a bunch of people because you find lots of good stuff down in the garage. Okay, this is a little test of the table to see if I can split this door. This is a hollow door right here to make an, this is gonna make an off-take table for me over here. I have an off-take assistant right now because I don't have an off-take table. So I'm gonna back it up. I'm gonna use the fence. I have a splitter and this piece is going to go off there. I'll, I'll manage it. My assistant Shy will take it as it comes off there. Okay, all right. I think the worst thing that can really happen is that, I've got to turn on the, is that I might make a crooked cut. That's just... Okay, what have I done here? I have, these bolts are part of the headboard that I got and cut down. And then these bolts I installed and then I zip tied them. And they're very strong and very solid. This isn't wiggling at all. And there's three of them down the line. I put in my own holes. I drilled holes into the flange to do that, but it's the right combination at the right height because otherwise I would have been interfering 
with the flange here, which is necessary to hook onto for the for the fence. So so and I, I just like the way it's all set up and this makes a great desk. And I want the wrench to be right here. I want this wrench to be right on the bar right here so I can just grab it and it never leaves. But I can't do that because the fence needs to slide over that place. And in fact, the fence, the fence needs this area, this facet of the bar too. And I've been using them and it's fine, but they move around and they especially come off with the, and they don't stay on very well. That's not very practical. So I'm going to mount one magnet here and see if that's enough. And then if it isn't, I'll put a second magnet here. That was pretty easy. Now I have a tap. And this tap is designed to go on the end of a drill bit. But it's very cheap. You get about I don't know, half a dozen of these for $15 in Amazon, and I've tried one of these with a drill, and it just broke off right away in, a, in one of these holes here. Um, so I'm gonna go carefully and just try to. I might, I might need some oil, but maybe. Much better. Just take care of your tools. These are just, uh, you know, for a, a electric outlet cover. I have plenty of those screws around. And there is my holder for my wrench. What should you get when you buy your saw? I want to give you a list of things you should probably order the same day you order your saw. Assuming you're buying a cast iron saw from, from Delta, this is the stuff I recommend getting. First thing, uh, you're going to need to decide whether you're going to make your own custom zero clearance inserts or throat plates. That's critical. I don't think if you own this saw, you're the kind of person who goes with the stock plate. So you're gonna have to figure that, you're gonna have to plan for, the per for everything you need and plan for the time to create your zero clearance inserts. You might be able to find some online. I don't know if Delta sells stock zero clearance inserts that you can uh, cut yourself, you know, cut up through yourself. You just put them in and then raise the blade. But I, I can tell you that uh, even if you have those, you're going to need a small blade. Because as I've explained, this motor mount doesn't drop low enough to allow a 10 inch blade to come up through. Now that's not true in many other saws. Plenty of other saws have three quarters of an inch of extra travel on the, in the downward direction. So you're going to need a anything between a six and a half and a nine inch blade. And it should be the same width as whatever you want your throat plates to be. So I have a throat plate that's one eighth of an inch standard and I have throw plates that are thin curve, 3 seconds of, a, of an inch wide. And I have had to make this by using this very thin uh, Diablo blade, which I didn't like. You're gonna, if you're gonna do it with one blade, 
you're going to need a bunch of shims which and I've made my own magnetic shims and I'll make a video on how to do that but um, if you don't want to go through that which doesn't make that much sense buy yourself a blade that is the same thickness the kerf the same kerf as the blade you're going to install and if it's if you've got a couple like a thin and a, and a normal kerf then buy two I've made a separate video on making zero clearance inserts and splitters which I hope you'll watch if you're going to get a particularly thick blade for this blade this is quarter inch I just use the stock throat plate and this works out fine. A few words about dado stacks. If you're going to get a dado stack, and you know, you know you're gonna get one, then I recommend getting one right away at the day, on the day you order your saw, and here's why. A dado stack, a good dado stack is eight inch, not 10 inch. They have a lot of rotating mass, so eight inch is all you need, but if you get a dado stack that's eight inches, you could use one of the outside blades to cut your throat plate and you don't have to get some other special small saw blade so that's two in one so that's going to be you know 30 40 bucks off of your whole price anyway now if you want to get a good dado set freud is around uh i think around 80 bucks they have and all the way up to 150 a very good dado set is going to be infinity at about 210 220 dollars that's got six teeth on each chipper and more teeth per chipper is actually better so you don't want to go with the ones that have two teeth per chipper and or you get a very good dado stack from forest for about 330 dollars uh, i would go for the infinity to get the best quality at a good price um, but it's worth ordering at the very beginning so that you can make your throat plates with your dado blade that's a good idea I wish I'd done that actually I don't this is an expensive blade I don't use it very often and I wish I'd gotten the infinity dado set instead of this one now um, you're gonna need a bunch of other things you're going to need hand protection pushers and I really cannot recommend highly enough to get the, to get the micro jig uh, gripper pushers you can see I've had a little bit of action on them and the the deluxe two gripper set everything it's gonna cost you 150 bucks and if you're buying this or any table saw you want to be protected and th this stuff is the way to go um, you know that a, a cheaper saw like a, a contractor saw spins even faster and is more dangerous this one spins at about 3200 rpm and these grippers are very important. I set them up for almost every cut. Uh, you're also going to want ear protection, eye protection, and a small $24 angle finder. Just get that right at the beginning. You're also going to need wax. I recommend the Renaissance wax or a paste wax. Get several pieces of 3M Scotch Guard. You're also going to want to get industrial quantities of WD-40. You're going to need that and you need either naphtha or uh, denatured alcohol. And I order this now because you should be using this the day you set up your cast iron saw, not later. You also need a framing square, a right hand square, or a very good uh, triangle that really is 90 degree. Lots of them aren't. This saw comes with a decent miter gauge, much better than a lot of the contractor saws do do so you'll be able to use and get away with this as a kind of a sled for the first several days to cut things um, until you can make your own sled and I've got tutorials on making sleds as well blade wise I got a uh, cheap $25 blade for cutting aluminum uh, that I used to cut uh, t-track and I don't like it uh, if I were buying again I would get more of a $45 $50 blade this is very very loud and uh, you can kind of tell it's a cheap blade when you use it. Um, and then for everyday use, I highly recommend these two blades. These are the Infinity, and I don't get paid by Infinity. I just love their blades. This is the Infinity Super General 40 tooth blade. This is about $110. And this is the Super Polishing Finishing blade. These are both thin kerf blades. It's basically the same blade, just with a different number of teeth. And um, uh, this is going to be about 
100 bucks is maybe $90 I think for this one for some reason and they're great I, I often use this I, I actually keep this one on my saw for most just just every day um, and then if I know I'm gonna be doing a bunch of ripping this does get hot and it slows down on a longer pass or if I'm gonna be doing any solid wood then I'll probably switch switch to this one which gives beautiful cuts on plywood as well so to me these are all you know 80% of these is overlap and sometimes I'll change them out but usually whatever's on is what the one I use you could also go with forest blades I think forest blades are in the same category they're just gonna cost more in fact at infinity they have kits where you can buy several different blades and get a and get a discount there are a lot of saw blades out there so if you have a favorite saw blade I'd actually love to hear about it. Um, I'm looking for high-end value for money. Leave uh, you know, notes and links in the comments and tell other people what your favorite saw blade is. I'd be very interested to learn. A couple other important things. Uh, when you think about the electrical circuit your uh, saw is going to be on, okay? This is a 15 amp saw and it draws, in general, less than 15 amps as far as I can tell. I I did not, I, I did get a soft start circuit for it and, and sent it back because I didn't like it. You will want to get a power strip that has a light. Uh, the light is very important because this is, in lieu of plugging in, in and out of the wall, this lets you see that it, the system is on and that you're good to go to turn on the power and this shows you that you can't turn on the power so you have a kind of a double protection two two switches it takes two switches to turn it on another thing that i have because i use it on the same circuit as i have my computer i have an uninterruptible power supply from amazon that gives me about four hours of battery time on my computer in case I blow the circuit and in case something goes wrong. You absolutely have to have a feather board. You might as well get it at the beginning. Uh, I recommend a mag switch feather board. I have been working with this one. This is the Pro for a couple of months and I've decided to switch to the mag switch work holding system starter kit. Uh, for one thing, it'll, the feather board will go on either side you also get a jig that you can use to attach other things to, and you get the 250 pound magnets that come out, and then you could use them for other things. So this gives you more flexibility, and it's actually less money. I have a sliver kit here, hanging on a magnet, that I have a, uh, I have a tweezers and a special needle. This is a needle that I have modified to make a sharper point, because most needles actually have a rounded point. And to get a sliver out, you want the sharpest point you can get. So I use a file and sandpaper and get that nice and sharp. And I probably use the sliver kit along with my light, with my lens light, uh, almost once a day. <laughs> so uh, maybe somehow you don't get slivers, but, uh, but I recommend a, a magnet, a pair of tweezers, and a needle. <laughs> and then I have a magnet for my tape measure. And so magnets, you know, some serious magnets, I just happen to have them anyway, but if you don't, you're gonna wanna order some magnets. I highly recommend T-Track. Uh, it's not very expensive. Get yourself eight feet of this stuff because it fits perfectly and you're gonna use it for all kinds of things, trust me. So just having this around, you won't have to order it and wait for it later when you need it. Now I have my Freud calibration and sanding disc and my hook and loop disc to set up to make a sanding disc. I got the hook and loop and all the sanding discs at Kling Spores Woodworking, that's woodworkingshop.com. They have a great catalog and they have by far the best for me, they have the best product here in this category and we're, I'm gonna put it on right now. So, so I have used some acetone on this to take the, any, any oil away. Uh, they have, Klingspore has the best price on this blade, much better than Amazon, but they're out of stock. So I, I got this on eBay for a reasonable price. Uh, Amazon is actually the high 
fairly high price on, the, on this product. And to do this, I'm just going to cut with scissors. Like that, and then line up the rest of it carefully. I can feel it's actually just a bit bigger than the disc itself, just by a millimeter on either side. down and peel it off. Uh, and you will need dust collection. You should think about dust collection from day one. And I don't recommend using a shop vac. A shop vac is lightweight and very noisy and will drive you crazy. Um, I really recommend a, uh, a real dust collection system. And I have a Rikon. It's 660 cubic feet per minute. I think a lot of people who order a table saw realize at the last minute they should get something for dust collection, maybe a, a shop vac. Uh, but uh, the more you get into it, the more you realize you must have a strong dust collection system. And it's the dust you can't see that is dangerous to your health and to other people who live in the same home with you. So I'm not gonna give a full vid tour here. I'm making a separate video on dust collection, but I've upgraded to a canister system with a Stumpy Nubs collection and full four inch plumbing. And then I'm working on uh, all the hose and connections needed to get dust collection to my other machines. And I also have a 100% dust collection mask that I use whenever I make any cut. I mean, this is, this is what protects your health. It's 100% filtration. And I highly recommend starting, the day you start using your table saw, put this on for every cut. Another thing you're going to want to get when you order your saw is maybe some wood. <laughs> uh, you don't need a lot to get started, but, but plywood in a few different thicknesses and different qualities will be a good start. Um, I recommend woodworkersource.com for plywood. And I think Baltic Birch is a good option for many people for many projects it will probably be bowed. So uh, get it thinner than you think because if you get half inch plywood, you can then take two pieces that are bowed a little bit and glue them up and glue them flat and you'll have a flat one inch piece. If you have three quarter inch piece, it depends what you're trying to do, but uh, it might be like an eighth of an inch high in the center across 30 inches. And I address that in one of my videos on making a, a large sled. So you might also try MDF core plywood, which I think is probably a really good option for many people. And you're just gonna want to get, to get some MDF, just to mess around with, to make blocks with, to work on cuts with, and you'll have everything you need to get started enjoying your new table saw safely. Should you buy this Delta table saw? Or maybe you should get a cheaper one. Well, you know, in the context of your hobby, woodworking, the difference between $500 and $1,000 really isn't that much. You're spending, let's say, $100 to $400 a month on your hobby, right? I spend about $400 a month. So I look at it as a monthly budgetary process and not as a single item. 
you think about the saw is a thousand dollars well on you know then you've got dust collection now my first dust collector was about 250 dollars which i then realized was just a bag was spraying fine dust throughout my apartment so i put that on craig's listing got rid of it and i've got 800 dollars now in a canister collection and a collector and a system with lots of expensive little blast gates and clamps and hoses that are that are over two hundred dollars and that's going the cheap way using a lot of tape uh, and then the next i've got about five hundred dollars in blades and i still don't have a dado stack that never ends and then sleds cost about a hundred dollars uh this one did and um and then it just kind of goes on and on with lots of you know supplies plywood uh little measuring tools you're always spending money look do it this way okay go to your browser and put type in the letter r okay if it auto completes ockler so it says rockler.com that means you have been bitten by the bug and you're a woodworker and that's your hobby and if you're going to spend let's say a hundred dollars a month Okay, that's $1,200 a year after tax. If you're like me and you're spending $400 a month, that's $100 a week. I'm trying hard not to spend more than that. Um, that's $4,800 a year after tax. You know, we're talking about six, $7,000 a year before tax that you have to make. That's, you know, five, $600 every single month I have to have coming in to be able to support my hobby. And that's how you should think about it as a kind of a budgetary flow rather than a one-time purchase. Because if you think that a saw costs a thousand dollars and you're going to get a saw and that's it, that's, n that's not it. <laughs> that's just the beginning. <laughs> it's a great hobby. It's uh, much cheaper than, than sailboating. It's uh, probably on par with wine collecting. <laughs> and uh, think of it that way. Don't think of it as an individual purchase. My message to Delta and all saw manufacturers is that zero clearance inserts are required. They really, you've got to make it easy. And your saw should just come with one. Now look, if your saw comes with a 1 8 inch blade, uh, send a 1 8 inch curve uh, throat plate with a splitter included in the package and charge $10 more or whatever it is because that's the thing we need when we take it out of the box. Even if I have a even if I have a thin blade, that's going to be fine. I also think that a blank one without any kerf should come in the box. The big problem is that the blade doesn't go down. I've given a couple suggestions for what to do, and I'm hoping that the next generation of table saws, every table saw will be able to go down more than half an inch so that we can cut our own throat plates. Also, I think you should ship in separate boxes. There, I just don't think there's any reason to put all the weight in one box. These leaves weigh 35 pounds each, and there's no reason you can't put the wings into a separate box and just make it easier on people. Look, more and more people like me are gonna be buying this thing for their garage. And you can set this saw up with one person, but it's harder if all this heavy stuff is in one box. Anyway, thank you, I'm really, I'm really thrilled to have this saw and I use it every day and just, just totally delighted with it. I'm David Siegel for Cutting Through the Noise.